Hello, ladies. We'll give it another few minutes for people to, to join in. My cold coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it keeps us going. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it is 6.01 and I think there are probably people having all sorts of circumstances, but wanting to, to log in and join us this evening. But anyway, we will maybe just start off anyway. So welcome, ladies. It's a pleasure to see you. And welcome to our monthly Her Story. So I'm Amanda Tumangelov. I'm hosting um, Her Story this month from Ireland. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And what I'm I'm really impressed about is our international connections and to have this platform to be able to highlight incredible women who've been really achieving incredible accolades and efforts in their life that we get a chance to see behind the scenes and to see the, the real person, to see what's been happening behind and what is the what is the grassroots efforts that we could be doing to actually make a difference and to collaborate and work together. So this evening, I am very privileged to welcome uh, uh, a real advocate and true trailblazer, Professor Sherry Delfani, who's with us today. And I will just um, give you a little insight to her bio. Um, Professor Delfani is an eminent academic, internationally recognized and experienced in environment, climate change, global sustainability and management. She is also part of the UNIR, UN Senior Associate and part of the Disaster Committee for MENA. Her expertise as a trainer, auditor and assess assessor in environmental and women's education issues has enabled her to develop and implement environmental strategies, policies and action plans leading to sustainable pollution control, waste management, recycling, public health, environmental health, conservation and renewable energy from many public and private sector, sector institutions. Her extensive academic and consultancy work has enabled her to positively engage and contribute to sustainable progress and future developments. She is a member to many professional institutions, including the United Nations, America Geophysical Union, the Association of American Geographers, American Association for Geodetic Surveying, UK Climate Impact Panel, and the Royal Geographical Society. Professor Delfani is, um, is a local um, counsellor and has um, global networks and a proven track record in environmental, strategic and business developments. So we are very, very grateful to have you with us tonight. And we've decided we will refer to Professor Delfani as Sherry because we want to keep it friendly and we want to really try and understand what's behind um, Sherry's success and um, I would invite you to the floor Sherry and please take it away. <laughs> Hello everyone thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity today and I'm really sorry I'm connecting you uh, <laughs> in the car I was in the middle of the motorway I thought it is seven o'clock then 
I was stuck in the traffic from London on the way back, so it was a nightmare. So apology for um, my sweaty and uh, exhausted face. <laughs> um, well, where I come from, and I mean, it's very friendly and short a snap chat, a snapshot of where I came from, how difficult my life was, and now uh, where I am, and then what is the uh, the future plan? I uh, left, or somehow you can call it, flee my hometown country, my home country, Iran. I'm originally from Iran. Uh, about 22 years ago. At the time when I was uh, very young, I, I mean, almost 19 year old, I had an arranged marriage. Uh, with it, I always say with a good intention. Um, when I was 19, and then very soon, unfortunately, I realized that he is not my cup of tea and lots of problem has started from there. So, when my son born after two years, I made my mind that actually I am not going to stay in this marriage and I have to get on with my life. But as you, you appreciate in 22 years ago, almost 23 years ago in Iran, divorcing was as a taboo. Even my own family could not accepted I divorced anyway it was quite a challenge and eventually I uh, came to that point that the only way I can sustain is I have to flee the country so I had to because of again the rule and regulation unfortunately at that time uh, the kids uh, guardianship is for father and uh, unless there is some sort of agreement that father can give the full guardianship of children to the mother. So at that time, the best decision I could do to, because he didn't want to divorce me and I didn't want to continue to live with him. So it, it would have been nightmare. With my dad uh, actually help and guidance, I flee the country and I went, the first platform was an easiest platform at the time was India. So I went to India and it took about uh, two years for me to, I mean, I start to do another master degree because I had to do something there while I'm, you know, trying to figure out which country is the best for me and I can rescue my son behind, which I left him behind. It was extremely hard, but you may say, well, how come, you know, you left your child? But that was the best decision. And as a mother, it is not easy at all. You come to that point that you have to make a choice um, to just, you know, to just survive. Because either way, if I would have stayed in Iran, I could not have the child guardianship. But by fleeing the country, I had a little bit of chance to rescue him so it took me about two years to figure out what I need to do so England was the next platform I managed to secure the PhD offer then I uh, traveled from India to UK I came to UK to do my PhD and instantly when I arrived here after a few months I settled I instructed my father to instruct the solicitor for um, proper divorce and then we battled nearly five years and eventually I mean imagine all this year when I left my son he was six months old and when I rejoined him he was five years old and uh, that those all this year I did battle hardly to um, technically I always say um, I give up everything in my life to just have my son guardianship. And after five years, I, um, I got successful. And um, I managed to save my son. I managed to have him in England with me. So he's grown up now. 
and he is almost 20 year old. He's a final year at university. He does law in Nottingham University. And this, uh, I mean, the journey I had while I was doing my PhD, I was self-funded and I had to cover all of the university costs, all of uh, the maintenance costs, and all of also look after my child. And it was extremely hard because I, and I was on the visa, full-time visa, there was no way around it. So it was quite stressful. Sometimes when I look at it, I say, well, was it, I mean, it's when I came to this country, I was talking to one of my friends yesterday. I said, sometimes when I think, uh, I cannot name it, it was a braveness or it was foolish or it was so determination, whatever you name it. My tuition fee only at the time, 20 years ago, was 10,000 per year for PhD, excluding the living cost with the little child. But when I arrived in this country, I had the entire money I have was 2,500. So I did it. I did it because I wanted. I was working day and night, a study day and night. And as a mother, I was looking after my child as well. Um, then after I got my PhD, achieved my PhD, that was my one of the biggest dream in my life I had. I managed to get the job at the university. Um, then my journey started, I slowly start uh, to build up my life, slowly, slowly, financially, and also uh, be more with, I mean, like a family union with my son. I remember when my son, um, after five years, we met in Istanbul, uh, I flown to Istanbul, the divorce granted, and I got his guardianship. My parents flown from Tehran to Istanbul, and I flown from London to Istanbul to meet the family and bring my son to UK. My son didn't, uh, in the first impression, he was in my father, uh, you know, uh, cuddle. He was in his arm. When I ran to cuddle him, he pushed me back. Mm. Uh, he rejected me. It still, it does hurt me when I when I remember that that um, that time. Uh, but it took him about an hour or so. Then he um, he came to me and he accepted me as a mother. And the first question he asked me then, where have you been all this year? Although I was in touch with him. I was talking to him daily, but that boundary, uh, because he was, he was brainwashed. Sorry, I was so emotional a little bit. So because he was, um, he was brainwashed and he felt that um, I left him. And uh, it was hard as well to rebuild that, um, relationship again and that trust to just explain to him why I left and also as a little child it was hard for him to digest it eventually he um, um, I mean he he accepted that that was a life and now we are I mean I always call him he's my best mate uh, he's a very good friend of mine um, the journey that was so hard um, to that stage where, I mean, I did everything as a mother and also I tried to just be his father as well. Um, I did work and about 20, 2015 or 2014, it was I joined the politics because politics always loved me. The reason I, I loved politics, the reason I joined politics was because I wanted to be more influential on um, to helping community and helping people and especially helping women and girls, especially uh, girls and women were vulnerable and they were in need and they want, I mean, they had a story similar to my story and they wanted to just build up their own life. Um, 
and they needed support. So I thought, okay, what is the best way I can, you know, be more impactful to the community and do more for the community? And joining politics was the one of the steps. I joined politics, and a few years later, I uh, stood as the councillor, and luckily I got in, and it now is the third, um, I mean, it's round, I could say. I am, uh, my seat is safe. Um, I tried my very best to help, especially women and girls, and uh, that was really the um, ambition and intention or initiative to helping women and girls. And even though when I got more into it, I realized that still though in Western country, there is a huge gap in terms of even the education wise, and in terms of, I'm not talking about the equality, as we all know that the, even here, women are fighting still for the equality, the equal pay rate, um, equal payment, and so many other things. And... Uh, and I found that, sadly, even in education part, women and girls have been neglected and failed. And uh, this um, made me more determined to even, you know, expand my networking and do uh, find a way to see how that's um, all of this, you know, the, my own experience, my own, uh, that, uh, in, in fact, the battle, and also the skill and the knowledge and the community are already working in the UK. Uh, we can all, you know, be joined together and help. And uh, I got into parliament as, I mean, getting, you know, in the politics with the uh, MPs, um, I started to having a voice, um, and I found it very interesting that also in terms of the climate change, which is my PhD and my expertise, and all we know that climate change is happening and we are, you know, suffering of the climate change. So I thought, okay, in terms of uh, tackling the climate change, we have to have the equality in place to educate women and girls to be able to tackle the climate change because that is even the uh, fifth agenda of um, United Nations equality education for women and girls. And we cannot, we've been, we have been neglected even in the Western country, women and, uh, you know, the girl in politics, in, in uh, decision-making, in so many influential organization, even at the West, women are only participating or being allowed to participate 25%, believe it or not. And uh, so you can now imagine, even Western country, the woman and girl is 25%, uh, you know, being allowed to uh, be influential. So in developing country, uh, we are far, far uh, behind uh, that scale. So I thought, okay, the best thing is now I come and I campaign for women and girl edu uh, equal education and also bring it and link it to the climate change. Um, that, that's where I, since five years ago, I start pushing it heavily and I managed to get to know the organization in Brussels. They were working in, um, in the United Nations and um, I was lucky, I could say, and uh, also determined. I got involved with that organization. That, that was my way and engagement with the United Nations. Um, so that, that was my journey. I'm still, uh, you know, trying to find and pull the different angle, whatever is helping women and girls. Uh, my campaign is about the education, equal education, and also the climate change. And as part of the politician, and also because, um, again, another thing really annoys me and upset me so many times, the violence, domestic violence against women and girls, um, you know, uh, going around. 
I'm so glad that a few months ago, UK government has uh, announced that, that uh, domestic violence against women in this country is now, um, they recognize it as a national security threat. That's amazing a step towards, um, I believe, protecting women and girls because uh, in Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire, where I live, we have had the number rising heavily uh, against the woman and girl as a domestic abuse. Unfortunately, the, uh, I... I mean, I don't know where where is really wrong and why in this society we are still women and girls are getting the uh, harsher and harder, um, I could say, you know, this treatment. And all I know as a woman and what uh, I have been through, as I explained, I feel that the only person or only organization really can hear us and can help us is we women join together and be united and fight for our right and recognize what is our right and support each other, help each other. Because um, it was in one meeting I was talking and say, well, we should not expect a man come and give a power to a woman. Naturally, they never do that and they don't like it to do so. So they want to be in power. The only thing we can, um, we can really do that is by to be united together. So the complexity I faced was first financial, to summarize it, the financial challenges I had. Um, as I said, I had to work day and night. I have to build up my life. I had nobody in this country and I had to fight for everything I could. Uh, other challenges I had, it was a language barrier. It was a cultural barrier. I had no family around me. And, um, you know, having lack of the family support or friends support around me, but I found it extremely hard. And in one, uh, you know, stage, I was really facing a high anxiety. I cannot name it as a mental health problem, but it was extreme anxiety. And um, at that time I was going through. So um, with... I mean, oh, how I overcome all of them, because my hope, my determination was my um, ambition, my goal. I wanted to be there as a role model one day. And I say, I did it because I wanted to do it. And I wanted my son to be proud of me one day to just say, mom, you did it. And I'm proud of you. That was my only hope for determination to overcome all of the challenges in my life I have, and I had. And I still, we as a, uh, as a human, we never, we never can say that, well, we overcome and we are fine. We, every day we have a daily challenges, but it's different what challenges we are facing. The main challenges as an overseas um, a student, mother, uh, resident, uh, whatever you want to name it was, you know, the finance, lack of support from the family, loneliness, um, single mother. Uh, you had to work for yourself, look after the child. And at the same time, you had to be, uh, you know, you wanted to be sure that actually you are not doing wrong uh, because kids are looking at you as a role model. And this is not easy to just, you know, to challenge at the same time with different, um, with different challenges. We, we have an expression in Iran, we say, well, a person can only handle one uh, watermelon in one hand. But I was actually uh, handling few watermelon on my hand at the same time. Um, so, that, and I'm, I should say I'm proud and still hurting me what I've been through. 
uh, the journey I had. Um, so that 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 is me. I mean, uh, still trying to be impactful. So if you, um, if you think that I was, I done as a woman one positive step ahead, or I done something that uh, maybe um, another woman or girl can looking at me and just say, well, actually, it is possible. My message is everything is possible, even though it is hard and challenging, if we want it. Thank you. I think I'm done. Thank you, Sherry. I That's amazing. I, I personally have about 10 questions I want to ask, but I would just like to throw it out to the floor that if people have questions, which I'm sure you do, please start jotting them down into the chat box. And just while you're doing that, I just want to say thank you so much for being so transparent and just opening your heart and sharing with us. Because I you're think welcome. there's a, a term that I heard, I can't remember who exactly, I know it's someone within Women's Federation, they coined a term, we had the matriarchy, we have the patriarchy, but actually what we really need is the familiarchy. So we really, I think listening to you and just the, the difficulties that you endured and that your father helped you initially you know, to well, I, he helped you to to be able to flee the country, just to just as a woman as well, understanding the the difficulties when you have a child as well, and when you have children. I think we're different as women. We're in a different stage of womanhood, and then there's an incredible strength that comes up in us that we didn't know we had to deal with challenges and. Your challenges sounded incredibly difficult, but it's amazing that you you could somehow overcome that. Thank um, you. And also, maybe I should uh, I forgot to say that. I mean, in terms of my job implement uh, employ uh, employment side, I was working until two thousand and seventeen as a full time at university, and then as a fellowship, you know, the research year two three years. And then I, uh, then my son got older. I got two year uh, job offer as again fellowship in Netherlands, Holland, and then I came back to UK again. I settled here, and I established also my uh, my own company as a consultancy. So I said, okay, I cannot be the office work woman to sit behind the computer every day. I love research, but I done my path. So now. The academic skill, life skill has to come to the reality and I have to make money to be able to survive and help others if I want to. So, and uh, I loved it. And I, I, it was challenging to set up your own business as well. So I switched from full-time to part-time, which I am a still. And then I established my own company and I started working with overseas. Um, uh, the, the company is around all around the climate change consultancy, waste management, energy, I mean, it's based to energies. And about my, my area of consultancy, I work with the individual government level, factories, industry, uh, whatever you name it. And as a, a speaker and even trainer of workshops for uh, climate change, tackling climate change and reducing greenhouse gases. And um, I don't, I'm not quite sure I should say or not, but uh, it was part of my promise to myself. So I am supporting also 1,400 kids abroad, orphaned one. And the point is, it's not only about the number of them, it's being built up. I started with hundreds and 10% of my earning, it's not massive, but 10% of my earning is, uh, going to them and when I make that promise to myself believe it or not 90% of those 1400 orphan kids I have under my you know um, 
financial and emotional uh, package mm -hmm. are girls between mm -hmm. two to 14 year old. So because I want, I believe that if we train a girl and a woman, a family is secure. So if we want to be successful in society, we need to... Can, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Someone just mute your phone. Yeah, sorry. Someone else who's... Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yes, carry yeah, on. I, I, I believe if we wanted to build a better society and more friendly society, we really need to work on, on a girl and woman. And uh, the reason I share that my secret of this is because I just want to say how passionate I am in terms of, I mean, the difficulty in my life I had shaped me uh, to be strong, to be able to survive. Otherwise, if you're not strong, and I understand that it is not easy at all, because we all face the different challenges and problems we have got, mentally, emotionally, physically, everything. But it is possible if we want to. I mean, when we hit that, that bottom, uh, we need to take rest, even a few days, few weeks or whatever, but we need to build it up again. Thank you. Also, it shows you your circumstances are particularly challenging. So this yes. is, I think, encouraging for women that, you know, they don't have that level of difficulties, but it's, it shows us this is where maybe as role models that we can show and support each other, you know, that there are ways. And then this is where I think, you know, especially if we could see on a grassroots level that support for women, because ultimately the women then probably will become the mothers and we all know that's where we need to really be effective in the family when we're educating, you know, our families and children. Absolutely. I will, I will open it up to the floor. Mitty has asked a question. Thank you, Sherry. Can you share examples of successful initiatives where women have played a key role in driving positive change in addressing environmental challenges? Um. Yes, I mean, if you want me to, uh, my own role model was, as a strong woman, not the politics one, was Margaret Thatcher, because she was named <laughs> as an iron woman. Yeah. And that irony and that stubbornness, uh, whenever I, um, I felt low, I felt lonely, I felt fed up, I did not want to carry on, I was crying, upsetting. <laughs> Oh God, a lot of tear and upsetness I have had, loneliness. So I was keep telling myself, yes, she did it. She could do it. Then I'm a woman, I can do it. So I came all the way, so I can do it. So yes, in um, women are extremely impactful. The vice, um, uh, so, sorry, I lost that. The UN vice president is a woman. Mm. So it means that in terms, of, I am very lucky that a woman is playing a key role in United Nations because she understands. And in terms of for environmental, uh, better environmental aspect, we need, I mean, a woman like Amina mm. to be in power. Because, again, we're coming back to if we want to have a better society and, in, and better environmental, environmental society, we need women and girls engaged. Absolutely. And we, we, should, we should not say that, well, if I do this little thing, it's not impactful. No, every little step we take it, it is important and it is impactful no one i know and i studied about i mean to shape my life no one has started from big and high level everyone had a tough journey and they started from a very very baby step level so mm. yes we can yeah 
And I will go back. Britta has asked, do you have a role model yourself that inspired you and gave you power? I know you mentioned yeah. the Iron Lady herself, Margaret Thatcher, but was there anyone else that? My grandmother. <laughs> yes. In, 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 yes, in, but in, the grandmothers. In, in, <laughs> yeah, in, such an important role. <laughs> <laughs> yes, initially my grandfather, my grandmother, mm -hmm. actually I loved, I loved her, her dearly, and she was very, very a strong woman. And everyone, I mean, I raised up in a village, and everyone in the village was, you know, respecting her because she was so strong. And even men were coming and asking him her for, you know, for advice. So. From even very little childhood, I was always saying, I'm going to be my second grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Now I have, you know, a passion for the environment myself. I'm an artist and I, I just love, you know, biophilic design. We really need to bring the, the environment inside so we can start to really feel things and have that relationship with a plant. You know, if you can keep it alive, Yes. And then the relationships grow and you can really have that connection. So um, that's one thing. And the other thing I'm very passionate about are grandparents, because it should, there's a, that's such an important role, I think, in yes. society. And even, you know, in the animal kingdom, I heard recently, you know, about giraffes and whales and the success rate of the young actually really is connected to if the grandparent is surviving and is alive. And we as women, we know there's a quarter of our lives when after the menopause. So what is that, what is that period of time for? That's an interesting thing, you know, and I think it's a very significant role. And I think most people would say actually it's the grandparents that really could, you know, with the children, sometimes we make a bit of mistakes initially yeah. when we're figuring out the parenthood but by the time I'm looking forward to being a grandmother that's when oh, I'll fantastic. be my own <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, sure you would be yet. a very good grandmother <laughs> <laughs> but I know I have the chance at least as a grandparent to uh to do that I'm just looking is there anyone else out there who would if you want to raise your hand or if you'd like to come on board any comments Marcia. Yes, yes. Uh, Sherry, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, beautiful testimony of strength. Actually, it moved me to tears, sincere tears, because I could see how difficult it can be for girls with those uh, cultural principles uh, like there are in Iran and uh, and being pressured by them and wanting at the same time to free and and respond to an original nature there is inside us uh, just to to do good it doesn't mean to do anything else just to be yeah. the most we can be and do good so uh, i really thank you for your testimony um, you're welcome uh, i think uh, an important part of your testimony was your strong determination and uh, your willpower to, to train yourself and get ready to become someone that can earn life actually, and that, that can uh, support your son. So I think, uh, I think it's an amazing testimony. I wish you just go ahead and free yourself you. completely of any pain you may still have. Um, yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. That's very encouraging. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Is there anyone else up, out there who would like to ask a question or share a comment? I cannot see all the speakers, so I'll have to ask that some another co-host there if you can see any raised hands please and and Schaffner wants to say something hello and 
Can you unmute yourself, Anne, please? First, I want to greet a very old friend of mine I haven't seen in over 30 years, Mikhail Segeva in, in Bulgaria. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, very glad to see you all too. <laughs> and thank you very much to the speaker. I'm fascinated and deeply respect with what you what you experience in your life and for the successful ending. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say, I live in Freiburg, Germany. I live at the base of the Black Forest. And this was the first green city in Germany. And we have, it's green is everywhere. The forest, everything is green. And um, they had a program here when I came 35 years ago that they taught, um, that and they were called environmental educators went into the schools and taught the children how to separate the trash. And they talked about this to the children. And then they would go home and talk to their parents. But after about four years, they didn't have any more money. So they dissolved this problem. But I have the very great feeling that um, on a very small level, in a household level, that women can do a lot. They can teach their husbands. They can teach their, their neighbors, their children, how to basically separate garbage and we went through a very difficult time in G germany with we it's all every night on the news you hear about the environment and the one woman up in um uh, bremen she said about two years ago she said actually what can they the reporter asked her what can you do for the environment yourself how can you how can how can we do this uh how can we assist you or something and she said on a very private level if you continue and you separate garbage and you do it on your private level, this is all you can really do. And if if one does it and then 10 do it and then a thousand and then a million, then you grow. But it has to begin on a on a grassroots level in the family level. Anyway, this mm -hmm. is my opinion. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Sherry, do you have anything? To no, talk. thank you very much. I really okay, enjoyed no. to see all of these lovely women around the Europe and uh, how am I amazing it is, really. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm just, I see there's another chat that's come in here. Hello, sisters. Thank you, Cheryl, for your story, your bravery, public mind and influential work. And at the same time, your motherly heart and duties. What I miss, dear Sherry, in your story is a role of a family and a mutual responsibility, both men and women for raising up children and share responsibility for the peace and prosperity on all levels, from a family to the world level. Yes, and moreover, already mentioned need for complete three generations. I, you know, I wish you meet a trustful a trustful man how anyway maybe who knows and create a happy time with them oh and thank a you what joy a, to become what grandparents a, <laughs> what a great wish thank you so yeah. much <laughs> <laughs> well we don't know actually who knows what's going on you know but yeah. um anyway thank you dorita from bratislava and anyway i think rita wants to say something and Brita, great. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was it's very inspiring to get these uh, international connections. I love it, and uh, I'm from Sweden myself, and uh, particularly in the environmental areas. Just like you said, I feel it's so important that women, uh, because of our innate also sensitivity to children, to to uh, nature, actually itself. Um, it's, it's such a very important <laughs> point. So, uh, yeah, go, you know, keep up the good work and uh, and be strong. <laughs> I was I was amazed when you mentioned this thing that Margaret Thatcher, well, actually the Iron Lady, <laughs> actually was kind of, uh, because I had just asked about the role model and then you came up with the answer before. <laughs> And uh, so I thought it was interesting. But then the combination with your grandmother, was a, what a great combination. Oh. I, I was very <laughs> happy about that answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope Thank we can you do so a lot much. of work together in the future. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.
also yeah thank you britta and also we've if we have another 10 minutes or so so if anyone has any comments questions now is your chance and yeah just getting back to the the grassroots level this is where we can maybe start to take a bit of responsibility in our own families where if we follow the trail of money you know what are we putting what products are we buying what things are we using and also what things are available to us freely so maybe do you have any other ideas of what we could do on a grassroots level that people could start maybe or how would we inspire especially young ones to to be thinking about the environment and maybe looking at the power of our our spending or what we're what products we're using and promoting what do you think sherry um in terms of uh, i mean i personally believe that education is very important and education and also either is practical or either is visual is important especially uh, as you mentioned kids always looking after their parents or if not grandparents if the grandparents are around that's the best I mean the way they learn and they can do so from the um, ground level we really uh, should do something even even you know encouragement I remember when I was what I miss I I I, how can I say, I never seen, maybe it's a better thing to say. I mean, culturally, I say, I'm not saying which one is better, which one is not good, please don't get me wrong. I remember my parents' policy was, they were encouraging us to do something successful, for instance, in a study or get a good grade with a good mark. Psychologically, kids are, you know, they like the praise and they like uh, to be seen and recognized. Mm. How it comes with encouraging them and awarding them something. For instance, whatever they like, if we want them to do so, we need to get them, encourage them to engage with us. Even for instance, like, like that lovely lady said, uh, separating the rubbish at mm. home. Mm -hmm. So that could, that could actually, a mother can be, a, uh, you know, the role mother asking the children to do so and even give them a chocolate, give them, you know, something like sweet, taking them out, let them play. These sorts of things we can do. And you, you would be surprised if we educate our little kids in terms of the environment. I see that that kid actually could be the ambassador the best green ambassador. He is the best one to telling off their parents later on if they yeah. don't do their job <laughs> properly. Honestly, it's I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> so by I, I somehow encouraging kids and recognizing them, well, actually, this is the responsibility you can take. There is two-way outcome. We think that there are kids, oh, it's too much for them. No, they learn how to take responsibility from a very little age. And secondly, they encouraged and they feel good that actually they are impactful either to the family or to the school because they can take that message to a school. And that's how we, we I mean, I went through so much detail, sorry, but that's how we can actually start. Encouragement, make them engaged, ask them for their uh, creativity, uh, what idea they have because sometimes we we are not thinking about the way they think so they're asking their initiative their creativity how can actually we do that yes. so, so they can i mean sometimes they can even step in and they guide us uh so th that's um that was my and also when they are elder, we can, I mean, um, um, you know, get them 
sort of give them the responsibility to do at the school level, high school level, university level, even, you know, uh, what they do by creating as a short, you know, the clip, because social media nowadays is very impactful. So um, asking kids, for instance, well, we wanted to do so, how you want to be engaged in this project in social media to spread the word. So they will come up with different idea. Mm -hmm. I can see Mitty has her hand raised there. Yeah, just to, just to uh, reinforce what Sherry was saying about um, engaging with the, the young children. I've, I've just reminded me of the Japanese education system. You know, uh, they're very much pro children taking collective responsibility in schools. Mm -hmm. Like even when they start the day together, they have to clean the classroom together. Mm -hmm. they, they learn about the environment of keeping the environment clean. And also they have uh, sessions where they go into the gardens, where they do like uh, mm -hmm. dealing with the plants and things like that. So from a young age, and also um, even uh, preparing, not, not necessarily cooking the meal, but like serving the meal, you know, at school to each other, they have like different turns. I think this kind of collective responsibility and collective consciousness towards the environment and towards each other is very mm -hmm. much needed because we are kind of living in a very individualistic society. Uh, it's a bit cutthroat, I want to get the most, you know, is often centering on myself than to think more about the bigger picture that is really needed. I, I was very inspired when I saw a documentary about these uh, the systems that the Japanese have for the children. Yeah. So just wanted to kind of reinforce what Je uh, Sherry was saying. Well, thank you. So yeah, much. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Japanese have, I mean, uh, as you said, they must take them out at least half an hour to 45 minutes per day to be in the nature, let them to be themselves. And in Finland, in Europe, it, they are doing the same. I mean, they. that's why they have the highest, I mean, um, and best outcome for the education in Finland, because there is no such a classroom. They can take them to the forest, to the, you know, to the park, or even every school, like a Montessori, they call it. They are the face and they touch the nature. And when this, you know, the teacher is uh, teaching them, kids can crawl up to the tree or, you know, smell the flower or pick up, you know, the grass or whatever. But at the same time, they're listening. And it's been lots of work around it to see, well, how amazing it is. Actually, kids are, because kids are very clever. They can, at the same time, you know, do so many things. So we need to really uh, make sure that kids are not only uh, artificially, I, I say it, they trained about the environment. They have to actually feel it mm -hmm. and sense it, touch it. Mm. So that's, yes, I, I agree with uh, Mitty. Mm -hmm. And this is where as well that you could see the children maybe need to, to get out. We need to have service projects, you know, beach cleanups, town cleanups, or even if you're at home, you could still grow herbs or, you know, small things, just yes. maybe in the nighttime. Have you ever seen the, the nightscape? What about a, a, a sunrise? What about something a little bit different? Drag your kids out of bed. You know, we do a thing, you know, walking into the, the sunlight, um, the sunrise. There's the, We have all of these things really at our fingertips. So, you know. Yeah, and also really... dur during the COVID period, um, I I was uh, reading a survey that more and more people got more engaged in the nature mm -hmm. because they were kind of confined in their homes and they couldn't really go out and do other things. But, you know, they had their garden, so they got more engaged with the real plants and whatever. Mm -hmm. And myself, I started growing things, which... Yeah. I was quite <laughs> proud that I could grow. But, you and know, sourdough bread. Yes. I'm still having fabulous sourdough bread from my husband from that time. So this is the, the hands-on touching the nature itself is has to be much more reinforced and emphasised, you know. Yeah. Amanda, yeah. may I make two, two, two comments? I just wanted to comment yes. on what Mitty said. Mm -hmm. The kindergartens here, they many times have... Um, a big area and they can also have gardens but we have something called 
uh, forest kindergartens. They li they go to kindergarten mm. in the forest. And it's a very, but the parents have to do a lot. It's the parents have to, it's not like going to a normal kindergarten. The parents must do a lot to support this. But also, I just wanted to ask another question that had to do with the environment. I would say it was in 19, the, the assistant the or the deputy chairman of the Iranian environmental agency was killed and this was a very you know this this is a very was a very tragic thing he was killed while looking for tigers up in in northwest iran this was on the i read this on the way on the web and um i think to myself there is many countries that really want to work for countries not only abu dhabi but there are many countries in the world which are th which are classified as third world countries who do really a lot for the environment, but it's not publicized. Do you yes. have any experience with this? Like I would say, like Colombia or Bolivia or Rwanda, well, though Rwanda, but um, maybe Congo, that there are some situations that they they can they excel at environmental protection, but it's just not publicized. Uh, yes, I mean, my experience a few years ago, it was a project for empowering women in Africa. Uh -huh. We went to Kenya, the villages in Kenya, uh, that it was really, really poor estate. But what we were, I mean, we aimed to teach a village woman to have, because they didn't have a light, electricity at all. And this... Uh, the, the equipment actually been funded by the UN, very a small one, how, I mean, we teach them how they could separate the waste, the food waste, and they could compost it, have a, um, you know, there's a meat and, and eaten, and then they could create with the generator, they could create the electricity. They yeah. absolutely loved it. And even I was so amazed, those women, how creative they were in the village, right in a the village. Then they got empowered, some sort of, you know, like uh, ego and power. They were <laughs> making with, or honestly, with even the fruit, uh, the natural fruits. They were making the jewelry, the, uh, you know, the earring. And I have a couple of them. It was amazing. And they were, you know, uh, they hardly... They couldn't speak English anyway. We had a local, you know, word translating for us. But yes, um, a lot. Um, I mean, a lot in the developing country they do. But unfortunately, the scale, uh, the scale of the work they do, because there is no such a proper regulation in place like West. Uh -huh. So that's why they are not either getting recognized or what they do is a very a small and minimum. So it doesn't, I mean, a spot line but of actually they have done it. I always, when I talk to them, I say, well, don't lose hope. You do your bit. And uh, because everything is started, and I believe even in Europe, in West, 100 years ago, every revolutionary has a start. And even we as a woman recognized as equal rights 100 years ago. They've been given a chance to vote. So it's not actually 200 years ago. It's very recent, less than a century. So, I, I'm, yes, you know, going back to your point, yes, they do. They do a lot. But unfortunately, be a lack of, I mean, it's the cultural barrier, uh, finance, which is the main one, and religious uh, barrier in the developing country. So all of these elements, women and girls, most of the time, like Far East Asia or even in Africa, they pulled out from their school and education to just provide the wood from, you know, far distance to, um, to set a fire, cook, or to collect water. So all half a day of this girl and woman really wasted by just bring water and bring food for the basic need of the family. So those still we have got a lot, which is heartbreaking uh, to do, as I said. But um, UN is doing their best to. But if we wanted to, I mean, as you know, the education always takes time. It's not quick fix. It takes time. Financing is a crucial part, 
And all of this battle I mentioned has to, I mean, the woman has to be educated to be brave enough to do so because most of the women I face, they are so frightening and so fearful of doing any step. They are so talented, but they are so fearful to do anything. Thank you for your question, Anne. And would you believe we are already almost over time, but we're, oh. it was, I think you have to come back another time <laughs> because <laughs> there's still a lot of questions that I'm thinking about. And one thing I have to say, thank you so much, Sherry. And also You're welcome. just that you pulled over to the side of the road, even though your challenge is in the day in the London traffic and you showed up and you're looking great. And we really appreciate Thank you. you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank and also, you. it gives us a bit of hope. And one thing I can see is once we have a bit of hope and once we can see the next step that we can take, that's where we can start building momentum. But if we yes. lose hope, that's when we have the, the problem of apathy and what's the point. Whereas I think you're inspiring, hopeful. Let's work together and get a little um an activity or something absolutely absolutely as as uh, you know in english we have a quotation we say if there is a will there is a hope there is a way there is sorry a way. If there, is, there a is, will, is a way there is a way so it That's means it. that anytime <laughs> i am you know i lose hope i yeah. i remind myself when there is a will there is a way so don't That's give up <laughs> and once we find the good ones and we hang on to each other and support each other, you know, we can Absolutely. really see things happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So listen, thank you again, Sherry. Thank, thank you to all of you. you. Have a lovely, lovely evening. You thank too. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Joanna. Bye.